Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it is, wherever you are, on this May 4th. Uh, may the 4th be with you uh, as uh, we record the latest episode of Cloud Unfiltered. Today's guest is Ross Jimenez of Sandia Labs. He's the manager of Cloud Services. Welcome, Ross. Thank you, and thank you for the invite. Sure, thanks so much for being on. I will mention that, uh, that Pete Johnson is back. He uh, must have had a good time last time because he's still he's still with us to uh, to add to the conversation. So thank you, Pete. Hey, Allie, and uh, you know brought another troublemaker off of my bench here to to talk about some. Ross, as you're going to find out, has a real interesting perspective on on cloud technologies having both tr built one and having been a consumer of them on in multiple kinds of roles. So this is going to be a good good conversation. Cool. I can't wait to hear it. Hey, Ross, before we get into that stuff. Uh, why don't you tell us how you got into tech in the first place? Sure. So I think that's a pretty interesting question, number one. Um, so I grew up here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and it's uh, one of the primary employers is Sandia National Laboratories, my current employer. But my uh, parents worked for them, and they both worked as – this was back in the, in the 80s. Um, they both actually worked in the – computer uh, data center where they had all the supercomputers. And back then, my father literally punched punch cards to load programs um, into the large uh, supercomputers and mainframes and so forth that they had back then. And so I, my initial forte in terms of into technology was really seeing, hey, what are you doing? What are these things? And how does it work? My, my parents by no means were programmers. They were literally operators back when such things existed, but they would tell me about it. Um, and then eventually when there was family days and, and so forth, I got to go and, and see actually the, the computer annex and the data center and, and actually see the Cray supercomputers and so forth. So that really was, the I think, the initial interest in, wow, technology, right? What can these things, what, what can, what can these, these computers do? And um, I still have some brochures of craze back when I was 10, 11 years old that I have in my collection of kind of computer historic stuff. Um, but that's what my initial um, uh, excitement about technology got started. Um, of course, I eventually got a PC clone and started programming QBasic early in high school and hacking into the library computer system and figuring out, oh, well, how, what are they doing with this program that they created in QBasic? And of course, uh, spending hours over a dial-up modem and downloading games and so forth, right? So I started pretty early and then I always knew that I was going into something related to computers. I was very, more, uh, I was very much more interested in the business aspect of computing. Um, so I, I did start my career in, in college as a computer science major. I moved that uh, pretty quickly to the business school and and eventually got a management information systems degree. Cool, cool. I now I, I know a little bit about your history. Um, you're with Sandia Labs now, but uh, you're with HP for a while, right? Yeah. So basically, out of college, I, I took a job with Compact Computer, which as everyone knows, became HP. Um, HP, I spent quite a bit of time there, uh, about 12 years, and many, many roles. That's where I first met Pete. Um, we both um, worked um, alongside each other as well as worked together in helping start HP's uh, cloud business. Uh, but HP was an amazing um, experience, uh, as well as Compaq before HP came around. And I primarily spent the majority of that time in e-commerce roles, uh, helping create the e-commerce websites, as well as the call center tools. And then I did a quite extensive um, three-year stint as an enterprise architect. And that's when I initially actually started learning about cloud, because this was been, this was around 2009. Um, and that's when really, you know, this new thing called AWS was, was starting up. And it was like, wow, what is this? And my job was to really think about it from a CIO perspective um, in terms of what are the potential um, impact to enterprise IT and to HP's business. So I did a lot of briefings to the CIO office and the CIO staff on that as well as other emerging trends. Was that a fun time? Did you feel like HP was going after it, like jumping in with both feet or was it more of a defensive play? I think initially um, 
So first off, it was a fun time um, yeah, in was. terms in terms of HP. I think um, they took a little bit to really get excited about it. Um, I think it was more of let's see what this is. Um, but once they actually start made the decision to start the HP Cloud business, um, they they really tried to take off from the perspective of what how they knew to do it. Right. Um, I had already been at HP for over 10 years at that time. So I had seen other businesses and uh, obviously there was a very mature business in the hardware business and, and, and so forth. Um, but this was really, and the software was really done through acquisitions of several and you know many companies, both up and down from the standpoint of enterprise type software to consumer type software. So this was really, a, I think a little, more of a new entry for them, and it, I don't. I don't want to say it's a. It was a bad effort because I think it was for uh, what they knew at the time, and I, I definitely was glad to be part of one of the initial folks to help build that business. Cool. Well, I wanted to be sure we, we covered that because that I think that's pretty neat to have been in uh, in that so early. You know, yeah. at, at a time that a lot of companies didn't know what to do with cloud or whether to take it seriously, and to to have that opportunity to push it forward must have been neat. Um, Pete, I will uh, let you jump in since uh, I know you've got some terrific questions today that you're dying to ask. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you for now. Well, thanks. Um, well, b before I get into the techie questions, I'm going to surprise you with with a, a non techie question here, Ross. So when we when we first started working together in HPIT, and then you brought me over on your your developer experience team for. Um, for HP Cloud, and we started building the CLIs and the consoles and so forth. We had an offsite in your hometown there of Albuquerque. Okay. And just so we can like plug <laughs> Albuquerque cuisine properly, can, can you educate our audience here on what the etiquette is for burrito ordering and your sauce <laughs> you going to a Tex-Mex restaurant in Albuquerque? Can you make sure everybody is clear on that? Well, the first thing to clarify is it's not Tex-Mex, it's, it's New Mexican food. Okay, see, I had to put that in there because yes. I need to correct me. <laughs> and that's really a thing with native New Mexicans, right? It's, it's very different than Tex-Mex or um, traditional Mexican food. It's, it's really its own little thing here in New Mexico. And I think the, the key thing you want me to point out is uh, our state question is, is red or green. And that is, do you want red chili or green chili with basically everything, but especially burritos? <laughs> But what if you want both, Ross? That's my favorite part of uh -huh. this. Then you say you would like it Christmas. Christmas. You'd like there it you Christmas. So if you go I, into a restaurant in Albuquerque, be sure to order your burrito Christmas. And, and right. everyone will know what you're talking about. And they'll know so what you're talking about. They strange. will? Oh, absolutely. Really? And okay. you can get basically green chili on everything from your pizzas from Pizza Hut to any burger joint to anywhere you go, they're going to have green chili as something you can add to it. That sounds like a really good place to live. <laughs> well, I wanted to get the important stuff out of the way early <laughs> on in the conversation before before a conversation turned to cloud. So it sounds, to, it sounds right. to me, Pete, like you didn't order your burrito right. <laughs> no, I I did. I followed. He was my he was my boss. What was I going to do? Not follow directions. <laughs> and I ordered mine Christmas, and it was great. Awesome. So let, let me turn this because Ross, you have this you have this interesting perspective, I think, because you know you and I helped build a public cloud, and you've you've since been uh, consuming them in a wide variety of different roles. You're now with um, you know with a with a government agency. You've been in R and D groups. You've done things with startups. How hard is that to do? do you, how much do you think people appreciate what the building side of this is like, and and really what AWS, Google, and Azure have, have really got going on at scale here? I don't think they appreciate it much at all, but I, but, I, but I don't think that's really a bad thing. I just don't think they have the ability to realize the scale, right? And the one thing about that question I think is really interesting is for AWS and Google, those are really cloud native companies. So right. I don't think really it's a stretch for them. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing they've done. Um, by any means, but I really think it's more amazing for Azure because that was a traditional, uh, Microsoft obviously had been around. By the way, Microsoft started in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's that's trivia, computer trivia. Didn't know that, did not yeah. know that. There's a great picture of Bill Gates, you know, getting arrested and 
in Albuquerque if you've ever the seen bulldozer, that. bulldozer, right? The bulldozer yes. story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, you can look that up. Um, but, um, you know, the key thing is Azure, right? So when I look at it, um, it is amazing that AWS and Google have done so well and are, have these amazing cloud scale businesses. But I also think, well, they kind of started in a very cloud native manner. Their culture was very cloud native. Whereas Microsoft, I remember seeing them order racks and racks and, you know, many cabinets and hundreds of thousands of dollars of servers from HP, right? They were, they were much more traditional business like HP that uh, decided to move into cloud and really bet the company on it. And really, obviously the technology heritage was there, but I really see things both also from not only the tech side, but from the, from the cultural organizational change side, because I often think that, well, the technology is usually the easy piece. It's really about, well, if I need to change the culture within a company to be able to do something differently, how hard is that? And so when I look at it, I think about it, wow, that's, it's been really, really impressive. So I give, uh, you know, I give those other companies A's, but I give Microsoft an A plus uh, given their commitment to Azure and the progress they've made. Yeah, and it, I mean, they've made this turn twice, really, right? I mean, because it, it used to be, I mean, you mentioned the, the the founding in Albuquerque story, right? It used to be they were exclusively desktop, right? And I don't know if you remember this, I was one of about two dozen people at HP who was on the Windows NT beta. I remember when it when NT 4.0 came out and we went to the launch parties, it was a big deal. Yeah, I was, I was NT, that was the last certification I got, was I was NT 4.0 certified back yeah. then. Yeah, I was too for Workstation, yeah. Right, so they made this pivot to the data center and then as you point out, they, they, took, that, they, they took that data center what they've learned over that that amount of time, and they pivoted it into this, you know, cloud scale kind of thing. And I don't know really the investment, but they must invest it. Um, I don't know what the industry numbers say, but it's a, it's significant, right? Well, yeah, I would think it would have had to been massive, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 I I have to think if I was at another company like an HP or like any of the other industry giants at the time, I would kind of be like, oh, I wish we'd done that. I wish we could have done that. I mean you have to look at it with respect because it is hard to pivot a company that large. Yes. And it took a lot of courage because basically they were bet betting the company, right? Yeah, and that's absolutely. how big of an investment it is. Well, and I think, and again, without revealing too much of what, what we saw in our HP days, I, I think the thing that they really did a good job on was that people don't think about when you're, when you're trying to, to build a business like this, they got the sales comp, right? Right. They, they made it. I mean, basically they gave all kinds of credits for on-prem Azure to sort of buy themselves some time to build up some of the public cloud stuff. So their sales force was still getting credit and still to this day, even with, with the, what they're doing with Azure Stack, they still get credit for some of the on-prem stuff while they start to transition to a monthly recurring revenue model, much like what we're doing here at Cisco. Yeah, and it's really um, impressive that they've not wavered, right? They've stuck with it. I remember the early days of Azure, and by no means do I think Azure is the best cloud public cloud provider. But I remember the early days, and it was pretty rough, right? Yeah, <laughs> they've, they've made uh, they've made great strides in improving um, the total experience of Azure and capabilities. Now, the scale that we've seen, right, is I mean, when when we started competing directly with with Amazon at HP, there were like six services, and I remember like what a big deal it was when they added like VPCs. I mean, it's easy, to, it's easy to forget that it used to be every VM you'd spin up on AWS had a public IP address and it was a much larger attack surface from a security perspective and that kind of stuff. But if, if you go and look, and this isn't just true of AWS, but it's true of all the other big guys as well, the list of services now is overwhelming to the point that no one person can have a working knowledge of all of them, even if you're Werner Vogels, right? So. Do you think that we're starting to see like a critical mass where where we're not going to see as many new service offerings as we've seen in the past, or do you think it's going to grow and it's just going to become splintered in terms of where you in, end up investing your time? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting problem, and yeah, it's 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 amazing to. I remember when there was four or five services on AWS, right? When I was very first looking at it and and playing with it. Um, and now it barely fits on your screen, right? Yeah, it barely does. Even with a <laughs> with a wide aspect HD monitor, right? There, there's they're gonna they're gonna run out of room there eventually. Um, and I really think that um, 
they're going to have to do something. It's an interesting problem, right? Um, I personally love the stuff that's higher in the stack. So do and I. really, you see many of that. Uh, you see much, many of the providers uh, with a great um, offering around uh, machine learning and so forth and, and higher level based services. And I, I, I think that's really exciting, which is very different than some of the very low level uh, low in the architecture stack, uh, traditional kind of architecture stuff or uh, compute infrastructure stuff. Um, so I, you know, it's a it's a good question. Um, I think they're going to eventually going to have to uh, figure out how to market to the various groups of um, within enterprises and and uh, across the board to really kind of shape where that where how you kind of um, convey the various capabilities because right. they're so varying, right? You got, you got things that are really very far apart. Um, so, um, it, it's an interesting problem. Um, I think the key thing is, you know, Amazon, it's all about velocity and, and most yeah. tech companies, it is all about velocity, right? So really their differentiators, not, um, any specific capability. It's, it's being able to innovate quicker and, and launch new ones. And that's exactly what we've seen. So do you think it's gotten to the point with that where you mentioned you're a fan of the higher order services and that speaks to the velocity point that you were just making. Is there going to come a point and maybe you personally have already gotten there. Is there going to come a point where you've spun up your last EC2 instance? That's a great question too. Um, I personally hope so. Um, you know, the, the lower and the stack tech guys are going to, you know, I might have just <laughs> upset people. Uh, but personally, I think the higher kind of level in the stack stuff you can do is really just about productivity, like you said. As a developer, and this is the beauty of things like Pazes, right, and Heroku and, 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 and so forth. If I don't have to worry about the low level infrastructure, in my mind, that's, that's the best scenario. Right. Um, eventually, when you're at a certain scale, um, so with success comes other problems, and eventually you might have to... Um, worry about such things because you kind of have to roll your own in some cases. Uh, that's usually the route uh, many businesses take, right? They start with something like Heroku because it's guys writing software and they don't want to manage infrastructure. So they they launch the product on a PaaS, but eventually they have growing pains and they realize, okay, well, we better we better run our own stack on, on AWS or some other provider. And, and they're kind of forced into, let me learn more and more about it. However, obviously the, the hottest thing in tech today or one of the hottest things is, is containers and, and orchestration platforms like Kubernetes, you know, that also kind of changes the game, right? We're kind of moving to a model where now we have uh, containerized uh, execution environments where I can run an application really anywhere and I don't really have to know the infrastructure as well as advent of things like serverless, right? So right. It's, it's a really interesting time, but I think that's where it's going. Um, and that's kind of what I've always thought. Uh, that's what I would personally like anyhow, in terms of I'm just not alone in the stack infrastructure guy. So I'd prefer as a, as a really an application or a middle of the stack up kind of guy and more of a creative that, um, you know, if I don't have to worry about the stuff that actually keeps the lights on, then, you know, it, it should just work, right? I shouldn't have to know the details about it. Well, it sounds like that you think that if if you reach scale with your application that you then have to worry about those things like tighter security tighter you know uh the, the costs that come along with with doing public cloud as opposed to having it on-prem with your own kubernetes cluster as an example so you, you still think that's a thing i mean do you, we, we had this pendulum if you think of it as this like pendulum analogy where so long you know it was it had really big clamps on the physical servers and if you did four releases a year you were just smoking right and now we go to this model where I'm gonna I'm gonna run my credit card on AWS and I'm gonna go do weekly releases and you know but maybe I expose myself to some security things or maybe my my operations aren't as clean as they might be but it sounds like you think there's still there's still some validity to sort of swinging that pendulum back towards the middle a little bit. I think I mean I, I used to think that um, now with more and more of the serverless kind of models and Kubernetes and containers really maturing, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that actually might not be the case, right? Um, we're still along, I, I think we're still somewhat early in the maturity curve for Kubernetes, right? It's come a long way. I was involved with it very early on back at CenturyLink Innovation Labs when we did 
a lot of early Docker and container work. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's obviously super high velocity and improving, um, uh, incremental or substantially really quickly. Right. So, um, I think, uh, that solves a lot of problems, um, and will be the new way to do things. And it also creates many new business models, I think, in terms of, well, how do you deliver software and what kind, what kind of things can you do, um, using not just containerized applications, but um, sidecar containers and and containers as a delivery model, right? I was looking at a, a, a very interesting machine learning uh, startup uh, called Machine Box, and they basically do uh, machine learning within a container. Right. And I abstract the pain of machine learning because if you've actually gone and looked at all the TensorFlow and all the complex stuff around machine learning and yeah, you're not a yeah, you're not a math guy, right? You know, it's like, okay, well, how do I actually leverage this? And what they do is they create a, a they have several services and they basically deliver them via container. So everything you need is within the container, it's black box. And then they provide RESTful APIs for you to interact with those services. So they kind of take the complexity out of doing machine learning. And the other beauty thing, at least in my current gig is it's not a, it's not a hosted service. It's a thing where I can actually take it and run it on premise if I need to. Right and keep all my data local. So yeah, you're right. There's 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 so much growth in that area still. So we talked about the tech. Let's let's get to the people side of this, Ross. So when we were working together at HP Cloud, we had like 14 people on our development team. And it was a very different experience than when I first started at HP. Like when I started at HP in 93, you know, the coders were on the second level of the building, the people we were writing the code for in the customer service department, they were on the third floor and the data center was on the first floor. So like everybody was super co-located. So if you had to resolve issues, everybody could go get in a you know, room and, and whiteboard together. But we didn't have like the, we didn't have the, the technologies like we're, we're using now uh, to record this podcast at our disposal at the time. So as we kind of had some choices to deploy applications at different places, we started to get sort of, more remote. So like out of those 14 people, how, how many different locations do you think we were at? We had at least eight or nine. And that was in, that was in 2010 through 2013 or so, right? So right, I mean, right. technology for this has gotten even better since then. Now out of those 14 people, I'm going to make you thump your chest here a little bit. How many of those did you take with you to the R and D lab that you did, that you did at CenturyLink when you were doing some of that early container stuff? Probably around nine. Now, I was yeah. not one of them, and I'm not going to take that personally I'm because I, I, I left first. So it's not, it's not that you didn't ask. It's that I had another gig at the time. Um, so th that, the fact that you fostered that much loyalty amongst some really good programmers who I'm still really good friends with today, what's the secret? Like if you've got a distributed team, you've got people in multiple cities like this, what, what's the secret to having them be productive, to having them build some synergy together? To, to the point where they're willing to follow you in mass like that. Well, thank you for the compliment. First off, um, I think the the key thing is first off remote remote work. I'm a huge remote work advocate, and for one huge reason reason, talent can work anywhere, right? Right. So if you put additional barriers like, oh, you need to move to this city. You need to disrupt your family and, and move them all to wherever you're at. Or you just need to um, find people who are in the local um, talent pool. That's just such an impediment, right? So when I, I, I've had the privilege of building several, uh, what I like to call world-class engineering teams from scratch. And um, in both cases, I, I, I definitely had the green light to basically hire people wherever they were. Right, because that was one of the first things I'd go to the senior executive saying, yes, I can build you an outstanding team, but I need to be able to hire people where they live and go get talent uh, regardless of location. All right. So once you get the green light for that, um, you know, I think key thing number one is uh, obviously it starts with the people and the talent. You know, you have to get good people. Sure. Um, I was lucky enough to be 12 years in working at HP and I met a few key folks. Um, who basically uh, were uh, pivotal in trying to find other key people who they had worked with. So I'm a big believer of, of hiring through networks. Uh, I think in, in those two positions, both HP 
where I built a team of uh, 14 or so, I think eventually, or it might be a little larger, and then CenturyLink Labs, which I believe was a team of 12 or so. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, there might have been one, one or two people who weren't somehow connected to other folks, right? Um, but in terms of, uh, of running a remote team, um, I think there's some key principles I always think about, right? Number one, even though you're remote, you need to use technology uh, like Google Hangouts or some other uh, teleconferencing thing to basically talk daily, right? I'm sorry, did you say Cisco WebEx, I think is what you just said? Oh, yeah, Cisco <laughs> excellent product. Okay. Um, so talking daily is obviously important. It seems odd. And I'm really talking about it from the standpoint of a leader to the team. Um, I tried to make sure that I talk to everyone daily. Um, it always, obviously didn't always happen, but you really have to have that high engagement. Right, the connectivity, um, since you don't yeah, have Yeah, absolutely. Um, trusting, you know, really trusting folks, right? You really have to drive the mentality that, well, our culture is a trust first culture. Um, I'm gonna trust, but validate things, but, um, um, out of the gates, you really kind of build that relationship uh, with folks that uh, we hired you because we think you're you're amazing, right? You're highly skilled, um, and in, inherently, I trust you, right? Um, I also think that um, really just being um, empathetic and thankful, right? Um, you know, and these are little small things, right? But I, I like to. I think I have a blog post on this somewhere. Well, yeah, it's it's but, a million small things instead of one big thing, right? Absolutely, right. So part of it is like you know, don't sweat the small stuff, right? Um, I think a lot of technology tech, technology leaders, um, and I've experienced good and bad, right? Uh, if you're hiring an amazing team, you don't want to be interjecting yourself into everything they do, right? Your job is really to build the environment and enable them to do what they know what to do. N what, to do what they know how to do. Um, I, I've been, you know, I, I've seen, um, I've been, you know, unfortunately, I've, I've seen the other side where you have some technical leaders who want to basically influence every little decision, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really kind of a guiding principles kind of guy. I like to set some principles. And then, yes, if there's a disagreement, I can play the um, tiebreaker and, and make a decision. But um, if you hire great people, usually that's a very rare occurrence. Um, and then getting personal, right? And this kind of goes with being empathetic and really creating that connection. Um, there, there's this somewhere along the lines, there's this um, um, management aspect where management's somehow different, right? And, you yeah. know, they're, they're not your they're not your coworkers anymore. They're your employees. And I, and I really hate that. Um, and I've been in companies sometimes where that's really sensitive, right? It's like, okay, well, your management team is, is your number one priority and, and you have obligation to your managers, to your peer managers versus your employee, to the people on your team. And I really hate that, right? I, I, to me, it's, it's more of a family thing, right? If I'm building a close knit team, that's going to be super highly productive. Um, I wanted to not only be relaxed, but I want to be, you know, obviously there's, there's limits to, to the personal side, but I would argue as, as Pete mentioned, you mentioned that a lot of those folks are still really close friends, right? And if there's the right opportunities, that's how you, um, you know, people want to work for you again, right? And I think really that's one of the biggest tenants that I heard early in my career at Compaq. I had a manager who once told me, well, you're going to have various degrees of success in doing any project. You know, your true measure of success, Ross, he told me, is whether those people that you work with will decide to work with you again, right? So I, I take that very um, serious in terms of trying to treat people well and treat them um, in a very personal manner, um, not as a manager-employee relationship. Um, and then, you know, the other key thing that I think is extremely important is being uh, very transparent and being predictable. And it kind of goes hand-in-hand -hand with the other things. Um, you'll, you'll, as you know, people, <laughs> yeah. people know me as transparent and oftentimes I think that sometimes hurts me because I'm also very transparent to, um, executive management. Um, but I really think that, um, you have to kind of build a culture of transparency where that's expected, right? Um, um, because it really kind of leads to trust or mistrust, um, and predictability, you know, software is all about setting expectations and being predictable. Right, if you're kind of throwing in landmines at the last minute, no one likes kind of this anxiety around what's going to change um, or you know things that unexpectedly happen. You know, as as with any project, things always happen that are out of the control of everyone. But for the most part, you should really try to be as transparent and predictable as you can. 
Well, it's always harder to do when you've got bad news to communicate, whether that's up the, up the chain or, or down the chain. And I certainly have always appreciated that about you, that you uh, are not afraid to deliver bad news when it is warranted. You know, to that point you made earlier, Ross, about, um, you know, touching in with your, your team or touching base with your team regularly uh, without micromanaging them. I read a study just a couple months ago. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, it said that the most successful teams are those where the manager checks in a minimum of once a week, ideally more, but a minimum of once a week. And here was the interesting part. It didn't have to be a substantial discussion. They just had to talk. It didn't necessarily have to be about work. It, but if they were staying in touch on a regular basis, the important things would come up and would get covered kind of, you know, organically. And, yeah, and uh, I, think, I think it also, as long as the team realizes that you're not there to judge them, but you're there to help them and enable them. And so there has to be this kind of res relaxed intensity, right? Um, and they feel comfortable with you and in, in, in not just sugarcoating everything, um, but also telling you, being transparent back at you as much as you are with them. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really interesting. It's not always the quality of the connection. It's just making that connection and taking that time, even when you don't feel like it. You know, my I certainly spoke with my boss and she's been like, I'm so busy today and I don't even want to do this, but we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which cracked me up. That was tr some transparency. But uh, anyway. Hey, Go Rob, ahead, Pete. Have you found with by, by having those weekly connections with your, your individual contributors, have you found that like daily standup is more productive because they got an avenue to talk about some of these other things that aren't directly related to the sprint that they're working on? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and then I will also I, I, I usually have formal kind of one on one schedules, um, but I also try to every once in a while just check in. And obviously we use other technologies like persistent chat tools. Uh, be it Slack, I think I've used almost everyone now. Slack, mm -hmm. Slack, Hip Chat, Rock Chat, Matter um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think I think checking in is not always a verbal conversation. It could be just a a message via Slack, right? Let me kind of see how you're doing. And I think the the key thing is you make it about them more than just um, work. And, it, you know, I, it's not some strategy I take. It's because I really care about these people usually on my team, right? Um, I do want to know, like, how are you doing, right? How is your family doing? And and and, and how are your chihuahuas doing in, in the case of UP? <laughs> but I mean, I, I think you really have to kind of take that personal relationship seriously. And I think that builds respect and trust and you're going to get uh, a higher level of productivity and effort when people feel that um, it's just, just their manager role actually has some level of of, of um, concern for not just um, the, the the stories they're working on in that sprint, but also just generally, are they happy with what they're doing? Is there anything else they can do in terms of the technology space they've been working on lately? Maybe they want to work on a different part of the product or feature set and so forth, right? So it has to be much broader than um, I'm very anti kind of traditional management um, model where it's, um, you know, send me a status report and I will, I will, I will respond to it. Right. I, I really kind of like that high touch, but high touch doesn't mean micromanage. It just means that um, you kind of build that trust. Um, I think micromanaging really comes in, especially with technology is when you have someone trying to drive the decisions that the um, um, the technical team is trying to make, right? So be it um, patterns and practices, technology usage, uh, approaches to solving some problem. Um, and I love that stuff too, in terms of getting involved, but I usually take the approach that, um, well, I hired this amazingly talented team for a reason. Um, I'll interject concerns when I feel I need to and, and, and have checkpoints when I feel I need to, but um, I'm, I'm really here to, create an environment that lets them uh, do what they do best. All good advice. Let, let, it's been a long time, Ross, but let's, let's just quiz you real quick. Like how many chihuahuas do I have? Yeah, four. <laughs> of course he knows, right? <laughs> we haven't worked together in five years and he remembers that personal side. And this is exactly why I wanted to have him on and ask him that question about- So you guys uh, are staying in touch, it's good. Well, I know that he met his wife at science camp too, so it goes oh. both ways. <laughs> That's right, and his daughter's in the theater. See, and it, he just moved. Up. He moved up north. 
There's no snow on the ground, so I got I got that going for me now. <laughs> nice. Hey, we're getting close to running out of time. I don't know how many questions you have left, Pete, but no, I think we're good. I, I wanted to swing back around before we wrap up. You know, when we were doing that, when we were talking about the technology earlier about the different public cloud providers and. Uh, in particular, Ross, you were going into, you know, the velocity with which, you know, AWS is introducing, you know, new services and when are they going to run out of room on their on the screen? And and it, it got me thinking, certainly, you know, and Azure is doing an, imp an impressive job. But, you know, Azure and, and Google have a tiny little percentage of the market share compared to AWS. What can they do to change that? Is there anything they can do or is it just is is AWS doing so much better of a job or was it that AWS was there first, people started using it first, got used to those tools first, and it's just too much of a heavy lift to try the other things? Oh, that requires a drink. Yeah, let me. Let me <laughs> um, that's that's an interesting question. I, I think obviously AWS was there first, um, but they definitely tackled a, a different market, right? So AWS from the get-go was going after developers and startups, right? Guys in a the garage, they're creating a new software product. Let us help you do that better. Um, and and I think for the most part, they've really stayed in that market. They're now obviously trying to push more to big business. They're trying to get into federal government um, and really more the enterprise, e.g. the traditional, um, uh, the traditional, land, uh, traditional market that Microsoft has a very captured market in. Yep. Um, and I think they've been somewhat successful, but that is a very large market, right? So I, th I do think there's some advantages that Microsoft has obviously with existing relationships. Um, you go to a lot of many, uh, if you, go, if you get a lot of, obviously many large enterprises, um, I don't know the data here, but I, I would, I would be, um, I, I think it'd be a bit, bit good bet to say that if you look at a fortune 100, um, any fortune 100, Microsoft is going to be one of the top five biggest licensing costs they pay. All right. So they have big, big established relationships. And obviously that's great in terms of leveraging moving to a new model with cloud. And they've moved a lot of their productivity suite with Office 365, you know, stuff that is really not cloud infrastructure, but is delivered via SaaS type models uh, to that. And they're kind of slowly getting these enterprises and transforming the traditional market. And of course, the big thing is, they're moving to a better cost baseline um, and delivering these uh, cloud-based and 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 software as a service type services, right? As with everyone in the industry. So, you know, in terms of the question of um, how do these guys catch up to AWS, right? I think that's um, uh, if if it was easy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think there's an obvious answer, and I think Microsoft has obviously an advantage in the kind of established enterprise space as well as having a true private cloud um, offering with their Azure Stack offering, um, which is very interesting, by the way. Um, you know, in terms of Google, you kind of see similar services that Google offers, especially in moving up the stack to more of the machine learning type stuff. Um, you know, very similar. Are there services yeah. they could introduce that, that would somehow give them an advantage, things that Amazon doesn't have? Well, I, I don't know if there's any one service, right? We talked about the broad catalog of services. Um, a lot of cases, it's really just driving commodity businesses where they're they're getting um, uh, price points that are lower and lower. You know, the advent of serverless and really paying for the actual time, um, you know, a function is processing and so forth, changes the business models again altogether. Um, the question I think better is, is there room for multiple players, right? Um, so I see, I see Google and AWS uh, definitely very similar. Um, AWS obviously has, I think, a greater velocity, but obviously Google has a lineage with Kubernetes and they might have a little better um, native container uh, stuff, even though one of my old bosses is a GM of AWS container services now. <laughs> so I should mention that, you know, they both do amazing jobs, right? I don't think there's... Um, I, I, I think the key thing is it's not like Google's going to give up on that on that business, right? It, it's core to what they do, and there's going to be room at the top, I think, for multiple players. Cool, great answer, great answer. Well, Pete, if you're all if you're all finished up here, I think we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up. And and Ross, I I, I am under the impression that perhaps you don't speak publicly that much. Your job seems a little bit top secret. But will you be speaking at any conferences or anything that we ought to be looking out for you for in the near future? 
Um, not any of the big ones at the moment. Um, All right. So no, I'm not going to put any plugs. Um, my work isn't top secret, although the 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 work that goes on in a federally funded research laboratory is often very sensitive. And yes, there are secret work, but I'm really just focused on helping them implement various public and private cloud capabilities, as well as um, um, Kubernetes um, runtime environments and so forth. Um, a lot of cool tech. Um, traditionally, they're a little slower to move uh, given their government, which shouldn't be surprising to some, but um, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting place and has its trade-offs. Um, I've been in both small startups where, um, you know, basically jack of all trades and um, being chief product officer as well as CTO and so forth to late stage startups to many years with um, publicly listed companies. Um, so th there's definitely uh, very much many differences between them, trade-offs between them. You know, I've been lucky enough to be able to do amazing work at all types of categories of businesses. Um, and that's my thing. It's like my background's really broad. But my thing is um, I really like the creative side and the people side of technology. Um, and really my forte, I think, is building great engineering teams. So um, it, usually when there's an opportunity to do that and work with the latest um, technology, that's, that, that, that's what really excites me. Well, it, it, it's a, what you're doing now is a little secret. You know how I know? Why is that? Because your last three jobs, the FBI didn't call me and oh, asked me about right. it. <laughs> it's a little secret. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's, yeah. That's We're just trying to give you course. some cloak and dagger glamour, you know. Part for the course. Um, <laughs> the, the, that's basically everyone who works there. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks again, Ross. We really appreciate it. It's been fun. I know I've learned a lot. I know Pete has enjoyed catching up with you. So thank you. I hope you will join us again sometime. And uh, take care and have a great afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you, guys. I very much appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.